So, bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, welcome to our webinar um, colleagues out there in Canada. We have about 40 sites connected this morning across the country, so we're very pleased to have all of you participate. Um, so this morning we're going, to con we're going to focus on constraint-induced movement therapy as a new uh, treatment um, in uh, rehabilitation. We're very fortunate to have our very first speaker give us an overview of the state of the art of this treatment. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Andrew Gordon. Um, and he will be speaking on um, this topic uh, to kick off this workshop. Dr. Gordon is a professor in the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences and Teachers College at Columbia University. He is really a, a very uh, internationally recognized leader in this field of constraint therapies. He uh, has over 100 publications, <coughs> about 25 invited book chapters and commentaries. Um, he's been invited to present uh, work uh, in uh, over, over 100 different locations, most of them international. Um, so he's certainly recognized in this field. His interests are not only on the mechanisms that underlie hand function in children, but also these new treatments that are available and looking at the efficacy. And in fact, he is the first to present over 10 years ago uh, a case series on constraint therapy applied to children with CP and was also the first to publish uh, efficacy study on bimanual approaches. So we're very fortunate to have him welcome us today. We will have a question period at the end, so for the webinar people, just keep your questions and we will get to you um, at the end of this presentation. So please welcome Dr. Gordon. Good morning. Thank you, Annette, for a lovely presentation and for um, all of you for inviting me to, to be here. Um, I should point out that um, you mentioned that I, that I had a number of international presentations, but the very first uh, invited presentations that I had um, for a constraint therapy was to Canada. So I think you guys have had a long interest in you know, these, these types of intensive approaches. Um, so as you said, I'm going to talk about intensive upper extremity rehabilitation in children with cerebral palsy, including constraint therapy and bimanual training. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather, so if I seem incoherent to you, I'm probably incoherent to me as well, so I'm sorry. So I'm going to talk about these approaches that are largely motor learning uh, based. Um, and when we talk about motor learning in children with CP um, and motor learning based uh, approaches to rehabilitation, it's important to recognize that we actually don't know a lot about motor learning in children with cerebral palsy. Um, what we do know is that they have impairments in motor planning and motor learning above and beyond their motor execution and motor disorders that, that, are, that are visible. But they do improve with practice, much, much more practice than is typically required of a, um, a typically developing child. So, in fact, what, what we did some initial um, motor learning studies back in the late 1990s that um, were looking initially at kind of um, what are the impairments of grasp control, and we were surprised to see that if you give them enough trials, what we thought were motor uh, execution problems actually dissipated. And what we were really capturing is the very early stages of motor learning, and that cued us into the idea that they require intensive practice to demonstrate improvements. Um, so intensity matters. That's really really a key element to successful rehabilitation approaches. Um, and then the question arises as to you know how do we provide opportunities for for practice and you know what's the right dose of these treatments and very little is actually known about dosing in any rehabilitation um, approach this thus far. And you know the, an important element is well, what do we dose? What what therapies do we even try to look at? You know what the right dosage is because they have to demonstrate efficacy in the first place. Um, Iona Novak uh, recently published a nice um, review summarizing um, basically all the successful uh, upper extremity training protocols. And basically, what you can see here, green basically means that there is um, good evidence, uh, basically, and you should go ahead and, and implement these types of programs. Uh, orange meaning that, well, there's some evidence and basically um, 
you know, maybe consider these, but with caution, and red meaning basically that there is um, no evidence to support their, their implementation. I'm going to be talking about uh, four of, of these uh, approaches, uh, constraint uh, therapy, um, bimanual training, uh, implementing bimanual training in a home-based setting, and also um, indirectly goal training, because goal training I think is an important component of both constraint and bimanual um, training as, as well. So when we first thought about, well, how would you go about providing intensity, we looked at the neuroscience literature, um, basically going back uh, more than 100 years for the work of um, Charles Sherrington and basically looking at the um, effects of, um, of motor training and reflexes and basically the effects of uh, shaping for improvement, improving motor function in animals or teaching motor function in animals. Um, and this is especially followed up on by uh, Taub and his deafferentation studies of monkeys showing that initially when you deafferented a, a monkey so that they had abolished the sensation, um, they failed to use their upper extremity. But when you restrain the contralateral limb and give them motivation, primarily food, they would actually initiate the, the movements and you know, improve with, with practice, especially when shaping was, was introduced. And more recently, the neuroscience approach is looking at neuroplasticity, uh, basically showing that intensity, salience, um, basically um, skilled practice, you know, with motivation and reward um, is what drives the uh, changes in the brain that are associated with motor improvements. In terms of humans, um, these types of approaches were first started in adults with, uh, um, with stroke, hemiplegia, um, by Steve Wolf and his colleagues more than 30 years ago, using a forced uh, use model, basically where you restrain the less affected upper extremity of an adult with stroke and send them home, and the idea is that they would engage in their typical activities and uh, basically um, getting practice that way. Um, the first human studies of constraint therapy were introduced by Taub, uh, where he added the, uh, the elements that he had, had uh, used in the monkeys, uh, basically shaping and active training or active practice. So the distinction between forced use and constraint therapy is uh, constraint therapy is a, a more active training approach where a therapist or interventionist is working uh, with the patient, uh, modifying the environment, you know, challenging them and uh, basically uh, shaping to, to allow success and to make it more difficult and so forth. Um, this was tested um, about six, seven years ago now in the, uh, one of the two first multi-site uh, multi-site randomized trials and rehabilitation um, by Steve Wolf and, and his colleagues, um, and basically um, showing good success in adults with, with hemiplegia. So as Annette mentioned, um, we first, uh, you know, using this basis, we did a, a series of case studies uh, more than 10 years ago, um, basically looking at whether a modified form of constraint therapy that's child-friendly can be used in this population. Um, so since that initial publication in 2001, you can see a, a proliferation of the number of studies that have been done uh, using constraint therapy or variations of constraint therapy in children with hemiplegia. Um, there are more than 80 studies to date, and more than 30 of them are randomized controlled trials. Uh, almost Two years ago, Aunt Christina Leasen uh, held a consensus meeting of constraint uh, therapy researchers in pediatrics, um, basically invited us to talk about, well, what really is known and what is not known? What do we need to focus on at this point? So just to summarize where we are in terms of the, uh, the evidence of constraint therapy, um, it works. Pretty much all of the 80 studies show some positive aspects of, of constraint-induced movement therapy. Um, all of them are different in terms of uh, outcomes, uh, something to the effect of 50 outcome measures were used across 80 studies, but the majority of them actually show um, efficacy. It works in young children. Uh, basically, it's, it's been done as, as uh, early as about six or eight months, and uh, it works in older children, you know, through adolescence. So all the studies, regardless of age, are demonstrating efficacy. Um, it works when testing is provided for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for two or three or four weeks. Um, 
And at least in younger children, Aunt Christina Leason has shown that just two hours a day of a gentle restraint, even by hand, not even necessarily using a restraint, um, but just holding the, the better hand back and providing motivating tasks works in much younger kids, starting at about 18 months of age. Um, regardless of the type of restraint, um, whether it's a, a cast that's not removable, uh, cotton slings is an approach that we've been using in New York, uh, gloves or mitts, or even no restraint whatsoever, and just inducing practice through, as I show, will show you by manual uh, practice, will, will elicit improvements. And basically it works whether it's provided one-on-one -on -one in a clinical setting, it works when provided at home or in a daycare or a day camp environment, which is an environment that we've been using quite a lot in, in New York. And the important take-home message so far is that um, Despite some individuals claiming that one approach is, you know, you're, if you don't do it this way, you're going to lose out on uh, opportunities for, you know, further gains. There actually are no comparison studies. There are no studies that actually compare one model to another. And that's the only thing that we can conclude at this point is that they all work. It means it doesn't matter how you, how you, you provide these at, at this point. Um, and, and as I'll show you, um, basically, uh, using a day camp model, um, even, even variation of the model, it may not even matter because it's not necessarily a one-time training approach. So we adopted a, a daycare model after that initial case study that I, that I mentioned, um, primarily as a, as a way of, of efficiently delivering it, having kids come to us in the university setting, creating a fun uh, environment where kids will uh, basically interact with each other and um, be motivated and you know we can kind of centralize the administration um, of this. Um, we've done 26 day camps uh, in the last 11 years and we've had nearly 200 people uh, participated, um, more than 180 people participate between the ages of three and a half to 17 years of, of age with many individuals repeating. So we've, we've done a lot of these, these day camps um, uh, at, at Columbia. Um, we go for six hours a day for 10 to 15 days, two or three weeks of weekdays. The idea is that we believe it's important to be as child friendly as possible. You want to make it fun and motivating and something that's a, you know, um, the kids don't think about their, their, effect, their less affected hand being restrained. Um, we engage them in functional and play activities. We always maintain a one to one um, inter interventionist per child ratio. Um, it's not clear whether that's essential or not. Some, some people have done it with a, a smaller ratio of, of therapists per, per child. Um, but we always kind of feel like we can control the environment to a much better extent if we can uh, control how you're placing objects and, you know, basically, um, you know, manipulating the environment in a very careful way to allow success and to challenge them. Um, we use uh, repetitive practice or part practice, which we use to sort of shape the environment and get large number of repetitions per unit time. And then task, whole task practice, basically, where we disengage kids in, you know, full motor activities. So an example might be uh, whole task practice might be playing a board game, like Monopoly or, you know, something, where there's a variety of motor tasks, including uh, picking up a card and moving a piece around the, the, the board and so forth. Um, part practice might be um, turning over as many cards as you possibly can within a 30-second unit. Less functional, uh, but basically, um, and you can negotiate, you know, with children, how about we do some part practice and then we'll play Monopoly, and then we take a break and do some more part practice, and it's, it's uh, a way to just get intensive bouts of, of movement and, you know, very carefully shaping the, um, the behaviors. Whether it's necessary or not, actually no one's tested that. Okay. Um, always provide positive reinforcement. Um, we view this as a window of opportunity to train uh, parents and caregivers um, to interact with their children to elicit these sorts of, of movements and or, or behaviors. Um, so even during the camp, we get them to do homework for one hour a day with the idea that they'll continue this during the period of, of study. Um, we keep logs of absolutely everything that we do. Um, so let me talk a little bit about dosing. Um, as I mentioned, very little is known about dosing. There is one relatively recent study by um, Toluca and uh, Kay Smith and, and so forth. And basically, they looked at uh, providing uh, either three hours or six hours of constraint 
therapy per day over a, um, a three-week period. And basically what you can see is that in both cases you get parallel improvements. So basically this is uh, the pretest. This is assisting hand assessments, a, a measure of uh, the quality of use in which the uh, affected hand is used as a bimanual assist developed by um, Lena Kromina Sundholm in Stockholm. And basically, so a higher uh, score represents um, improvement. So pre-test, the initial post-test, one month and six months later. So basically, you see a trend for improvement that um, pretty much parallels in, in, this, in the two groups. The caveat here is that they use casting. So the children wore cast 24-7. So it's three hours versus six hours plus the rest of the day that the child's engaged in activity. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to compare how much active training is, is necessary in this, in this case. But nevertheless, using this model, it seems like you can use a you know, smaller amount than typically provided um, for these older children, typically six hours per day. Um, we have not done a dosing study, but we have done studies, and we can compare across them to some extent. Uh, where we've either provided two or three weeks of, of training. And this is the Jepson Taylor test of, of hand function. It's just a timed dexterity test. Um, a faster score um, represents um, better dexterity. And what you can see is that um, this group here receives 90 hours of training. This group receives 60 hours of training. And both of them improve significantly, but you can see that there's a greater improvement for the 90-hour training group. So, and this is only six hours per day, and then the kids, they were wearing a um, cotton sling, and then they take it off at the end of that six hours. So, again, we don't know the effects of adding the forced use component to this. Um, now, this is dealing with um, dosing frequency or scheduling. So, this is the same 60-hour group here provided in the camp model. This is a, a small group of children who receive 60 hours a week, uh, sorry, 60 hours of training, but it was done in two-hour sessions three times a week until they reached the 60 hours. And in these older children, ages 8 to uh, 10, basically there was no improvement. So it might not just be total dosing. It might be that the massing of this dosing into small and relatively uh, units of time and getting uh, lots of momentum may be an important component for these older children. Now, this is in contrast to younger children, where Aunt Christina Leeson has shown that, sure, two hours a day, at least five days a week um, for 60 hours is efficacious. So there might be some interaction between uh, dosing amount, dosing scheduling or frequency, and age. And that's something that you know, has yet to be studied um, formally. Um, this is, in my view, an important um, uh, slide that says that, well, maybe dosing doesn't really matter or the model doesn't really matter. Um, as much as we think. So this is uh, a group of eight children who initially basically received constraint therapy here. Um, so this is the pre-post on their Jepson Taylor test. We bring them back one year later and they've maintained uh, the improvements that they, they had achieved. We give them a second bout of 60 hours and they improve again. So the point being is that it's not a one-time uh, miracle approach. It's not, it's not something that you have to think about as how do you squeeze out every ounce of efficacy in this very short time, potentially at the expense of keeping it child friendly or convenient for you know parents and families, um, and uh, basically uh, you know how, how to, you don't have to worry so much about about all those little details if you can think about it as a developmental approach that can be given um, over a period of time over the long development that they, they're going to um, exhibit. So basically, another component that occurred to us, um, in the US anyway, people started taking the take-home message from these constraint therapies was just to, well, let's just restrain kids and send them home. And you know, let's not worry about the ingredients. And that led us to think a little bit more about, well, what is it that's important? And what are we trying to achieve with these types of intensive approaches? Um, and it's important to recognize that there's some bimanual issues that are going on as well. We know that even the less affected hand is affected to some extent. Um, we know that these children compensate extremely well. They can do bimanual activities with one hand that you know I certainly can. Um, 
they have an impaired ability to coordinate the two hands. They have impaired bimanual coordination um, in terms of two-handed activities. Um, and we believe that basically it's these bimanual activities that create functional limitations for these um, children rather than these unimanual problems. Um, recent studies looking at goals that families have in regards to play and self-care, um, around 85% of these goals as identified by parents and children were bimanual. Um, so that's something important to, to keep in mind. Um, and basically, there have been motor control studies that show that, uh, that the less affected hand can provide a template. It can extract sensory information about objects. It can uh, effectively create kinematic mirroring, um, basically showing the child exactly what they're trying to achieve by having them first perform the movement with their less affected hand and then repeating it with their more affected hand. So this was a, a rationale um, for which we developed uh, habit, hand-on bimanual intensive therapy. So this is a form of intensive bimanual training. We didn't invent bimanual training. This is something that is, um, has been in the uh, OT and, and PT community for, for a long time. Uh, but basically, we were the first to sort of intensify it, put it into the structure that, of constraint therapy that um, I just showed you, and to, to test this. The idea basically is providing activities that necessitate the use of both hands rather than constraining one hand and forcing them to use the other. So there's no restraint, basically the same duration as constraint uh, therapy, and bimanual activities, as I said, that, that necessitate, necessitate the use of both hands. Um, we have done this in a day camp model with, again, the one-to-one -one interventionist um, per child. I should point out that this, um, with bimanual training, I would say that the one-to-one -one ratio becomes more important because, as I said, these children can compensate really well. And you have to be one step ahead of them in regards to where you place objects and even setting up rules, you know, because if you just say, use your hand, you know how far that gets you in therapy and you know how far parents, you know, they attenuate to these, these commands. You have to set up a, a, a fun uh, setting where, you know, you say, okay, we're going to play a board game. Which hand would you like to move the piece with? Okay, so the other hand you're going to use to pick the card. And basically, in, in that you can throw it back to them. Um, so which hand are you going to use? And then let them you know, actively tell you. And then they're in the game. If they compensate by using their less affected hand, you can just stop the game and playfully say, which hand do we say we were going to do that with? And you make it more, you're giving them some control, and you're making it into a little bit more fun, rather than just saying the same thing over and over again that isn't going to carry over. Um, and we can designate the tasks or progress the skills in regards to very simple motor skills. The simplest is to use the affected hand as a paperweight, basically just to press down an object so the other hand can stabilize it, um, a passive or uh, an active assist, um, and ultimately, you know, trying to grade the activities so that that hand is used as a manipulator if that's possible. Um, we, recent, among, we did a number of, of studies of, of habit demonstrating efficacy. And we wanted to know, is there any drawback of doing this versus the constraint therapy. So we actually did a um, randomized trial comparing bimanual training to constraint therapy with the hypothesis that there would be greater improvements in bimanual uh, measures for the habit group and then for unimanual measures for the uh, constraint group, so specificity of training. This is the Jepson-Taylor test of hand function. Basically, uh, red is the bimanual training group, blue is the habit group, and basically you see very similar improvements that are maintained over the six months of study that we follow these groups of, of children here. So both approaches result in uh, statistically similar improvements in uh, unimanual function of the affected hand. Bimanually, you can see that the assisting hand uh, assessment scores also improve similarly and are maintained over the uh, six months that we follow them. So for these measures, on the plus side, it doesn't matter whether you use a constraint or not. On the minus side, it doesn't support the hypothesis. It doesn't, basically, there's no specificity of training at this very high dose. It's possible that a smaller dose might result in, you know, differences in, in, the, uh, in the efficacy between these. That's something to be tested. Um, there is specificity of training when you start to look at uh, kinematics. So this is a uh, drawer opening test uh, developed by Mario Wiesendanger in Switzerland many years ago for uh, monkey studies, 
And basically the, the task is to simply pull open a drawer with one hand and to manipulate the contents with the other hand. Now, a typically developing child or adult basically would move both hands simultaneously for with about 80% of the, of the time both hands are overlapping in movement. So a child with hemiplegia, that's basically around 25%. So it's very sequential. They reach, they pull the, the drawer open, and only while the drawer is being pulled open do they initiate the movement to the contents. Um, you can see after constraint therapy, there's about a 10% improvement in terms of the amount of overlap of the two hands, um, whereas after the bimanual training, uh, there's a much larger improvement, uh, statistically larger improvement for this group. Um, I should point out that during bimanual training, the children never practiced drawer opening. So this is a transfer uh, test, and it's suggesting that there's better transfer to the coordination of the two hands for, for bimanual training. Um, there are some other examples I can give you where uh, if, if it's unimanual, uh, re reducing impairments of unimanual function, uh, it might be that constraint therapy is a better approach. Um, this is goals, and as I said, most goals are bimanual. It turns out that there is transfer for the constraint group, but basically this is the, the COPM performance, and you see a, a larger improvement for uh, the children who are able to uh, practice bimanual activities. Um, bimanual training has been incorporated into a number of different um, themed camps by uh, colleagues. Um, Dido Green is, is one example um, of this. Uh, where she's created magic camps, basically teaching kids magic tricks, um, and you know, as a as a way of getting them to use both both of the hands in a fun, motivating environment. Um, there's a pirate group in in the, in the Netherlands, in Nijmegen, uh, the, in uh, Australia. They've used a circus group. So you know, there's lots of different approaches, and we tend to not have a theme on any given day, and for the whole camp, but on individual days, we might say. Okay, now we're going to do circus activities, and you know we'll kind of mix mix it up. But I think you know creating these sorts of fun, you know, clever uh, themed approaches is is uh, very attractive to parents and to kids. Okay, dosing for bimanual training. Um, here you're seeing some differences uh, as well. Um, this is the Jepson Taylor. This is a study that we did for 60 hours of training. And actually, there was not a significant improvement in the Jepson Taylor, but there was after 90 hours. So there might be some dosing effects that is occurring uh, between 60 and 90 hours in terms of having uh, an effect purely on the um, the more affected upper extremity. And that's because they're dividing their time in terms of how they're using their hands between the two. In terms of the assisting hand assessment, uh, basically both the the 90 and the 60 hour um, groups improve. But an important caveat is that the 60-hour group, um, after one month, they've already begun to uh, return towards baseline, whereas the 90-hour group um, here maintains it, uh, the gains that they've, that they've achieved. Now, what this suggests is that a dosing study isn't as simple as you, you might think. It's not, well, let's just perform treatment until they reach a certain level or uh, you know, sort of titrate, titrate uh, you know, individual groups, because dosing isn't just what the initial pre-post effect it, is going to be, it's how do they maintain it. So it seems that between 60 and 90 hours um, seems to be an important period for them to integrate and to make it more natural so that they're, you know, when you remove this kind of structured environment that they carry on and, and continue to um, use their hand in, in the same affected way. Oh, I'm just going to, how am I doing for time? Five minutes? Okay. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm not going to talk so much about the, the brain stimulation, but um, I just want to say that we have been looking at um, plasticity uh, associated with bimanual training. And what you can see is uh, basically there are relatively large uh, expansions of the motor map um, of the, uh, in this case, the affected uh, hemisphere um, af after training. So basically there's plasticity associated with this. Um, I'm going to skip through uh, all this stuff here. Um, I want to just point out that it might be that structured skill practice matters, so that basically providing a challenging environment and making it more difficult, um, this results in uh, a relatively large expansion of the, of the motor cortical representation of the hand and finger. 
where as in a separate group that just plays, just basically you give them activities and you let them play with the only caveat being use your hand, um, you get very little changes in, in the motor cortical representation. So um, this idea of providing progressive challenge and reward and motivation and so forth um, might have an effect on uh, basically the, uh, the plasticity associated with the training. And it turns out that it has an effect on motor learning because basically the structured or skill training group receive, you know, makes a greater progress on uh, goals that the, that the parents have identified as compared to uh, just providing these play-like activities. Okay, so motor learning matters. Um, very quickly, um, the lower extremity, we've kind of expanded this program with a group in uh, Brussels, uh, Yannick Blanhoft, um, basically where uh, we simultaneously challenge the upper and lower extremity in children with hemiplegia. We know that the lower extremity uh, basically is, is, a, is a huge important and may decrease over time. Um, most manual activities are not performed at, you know, in a seated environment, but basically involve, you know, fetching objects and doing something with them and then placing them in different locations. Um, basically, we modified this to include uh, lower extremity and postural coordination. And we compared this with usual and customary uh, physical therapy in Belgium, which tends to be MDT uh, based for equal duration, but spread out over a longer period of time, so not in a camp environment, um, but over a four month period. So basically, it's a crossover study. So one group receives uh, 90 hours in a, in a sleepover camp in Brussels, um, and the other group initially receives their four months of uh, PT and OT until they reach their 90 hours, and then each group is crossed over. One receives, the habitial group receives their usual care, and then the other group goes on and, and uh, is crossed over to their, um, to receive habitial. Um, and these are just sort of examples of, you know, activities that require, um, you know, both challenging upper and lower extremity. And, you know, basically, uh, you know, I think this is one of my favorite act activities, and kids really like doing stuff like this. Um, but even challenging the kids by doing a lot of activities and standing, or, you know, I know that balls have their own connotation in terms of uh, NDT, but basically just having them, you know, have to maintain their, their balance and thinking about, well, if I move my hands quickly, how's that going to affect my, you know, my trunk and, and so forth. And they, they actually attempt, they learn very quickly how to control themselves on, on these balls. So to orientate you, Quickly, uh, the red is the initial habitial group, and then they're crossed over to receive uh, their, their usual customary therapy by the, by the same uh, therapist, actually. And then here, basically, is the, uh, habit, the, the usual customary care group, and then they're crossed over to receive habitial. So for the AHA, you get initial improvements for the habitial group that are maintained. For the traditional care, basically, uh, there is no change until you cross them over. Um, the Able Hand Kids is a, a structured interview that you give to, to parents about the types of uh, activities that, are, that these children are able to engage in. Same thing, that basically there are improvements in function um, that are maintained in the habitual group, and it's only after the crossover period that you see these changes here. For lower extremity, um, we use the six-minute walk test among others, and same thing, you get improvements in the distance that are uh, achieved over six minutes that are maintained, and really only significant changes occurring again after the crossover here, and Able Loco is analogous to the Able Hand Kid, but basically it's a functional questionnaire focusing on lower extremity abilities, and you get the same general patterns of improvements. Okay, I'm going to skip through this for now, other than to say that um, uh, it is possible to apply these approaches to other forms of cerebral palsy, and that's something that we have been um, working on uh, recently. Um, this is, just addresses the issue of, well, what happens if you can't create these day camp environments? I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of um, organization, and you know, there's a lot of barriers which you'll talk about um, in your work groups, but um, for sure in the U.S. there's lots of places that they're not available or they're not possible to do. Um, so, we do up to home training program where we train caregivers, mostly parents, to train their children one-on-one -on -one for a total of two hours per day in up to oh, basically half an hour segments. So they have to go at least half an hour at a time, uh, four, hour, four segments per day. And we did this until they achieved their 90 hours. 
basically in vivo children between the ages of uh, two and uh, four years of, of age. So they're relatively young and analogous to the successful implanta implantation of these models in constraint therapy. So this is the, um, uh, the AHA score, and this is the mean here, and these are the individual children. And you can see that most of the children show improvements in, their, uh, in the AHA um, following the, the training. So basically, just to summarize, um, one is just to say that that works at least in younger children, and we're testing this in a more rigorous way with a randomized trial now. Um, so to summarize everything that I've, I've talked about at this point, um, intensive active training works. So just increasing intensity of NDT-based therapies or, you know, usual customary care um, may not have the, the important ingredients, um, and we don't really know exactly what those ingredients are, um, but it may not have those ingredients to, to demonstrate improvement. Um, so just increasing the usual care may not be enough. So ingredients matter as well. Um, as I showed you, constraint and bimanual training um, approaches both um, uh, are efficacious, um, and there are some nuances between them that I didn't go into, or um, not very much. But and there are other studies that have you know basically come up with the same conclusions, um, mainly by Ros Boyd and uh, Margaret Wallen and, and so forth in, in the last year or so. Um, these approaches are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to train, you know, say, well, I'm going to do one and can't do the other. And, you know, they can be combined over time. They can even be combined into one camp, starting off with one approach and then crossing over. And, you know, there are some, some sites in the U.S. that, that do this. And uh, Pauline Arts in uh, Namigan has, has done this in the pirate camp. Um, but that hasn't been tested compared to just constraint or just by manual training. Um, skill training. Uh, seems to be important for plasticity. Um, the low extremity seems to benefit from this intensive um, up, uh, combined approach as, as well. Um, and that's something that I think that really needs to be expanded. I think the challenge has been that we've always focused on, you know, what, what seems to be easy and, and attainable in a you know, very mild group of, of CP. Um, but, you know, if intensity matters and skill training matters, it should basically um, be tested in, in uh, more challenging situations. More is better, but not more of the same. So, you know, there's an old joke in, in New York about, you know, a tourist is in Midtown, New York, and sees a person with a, a violin, and he says, well, how do you, you know, excuse me, can you, can you um, tell me how I get to Carnegie Hall? And basically the answer is practice. And, but it's not just practice. You have to practice a lot, but you have to practice meaningful, um, you know, successful activities, the instrument that you want to achieve. That's a really important component. So um, I think that's really the, the take-home message is that these are motor learning-based approaches, and they provide opportunity for practice. And you have to think very carefully about what do you want to achieve in these kids and you know, what do you want them to practice and what skills are you trying to improve and you know, select the, the best approach and the best model that allows you to um, achieve the, those particular instruments. I just want to thank a, a large number of people that have been involved in uh, working with us in, in recent years. Um, Kathleen uh, Friel has been doing a lot of the neuroplasticity uh, work with us. Not uh in, in Brussels. Eugene Ramakers uh, in, in the Netherlands. Jean Charles uh, basically was involved in that early implementation of both constraint and uh, habit. Uh, Bert Steenbergen is a motor control colleague in the Netherlands. And Lily Hong is a former uh, postdoc and assistant professor in, in New York. So thank you for your time. Okay, um, so we'll first begin with the webinar group. Doug, are there any questions? So the question is about feedback and the method that feedback should be provided. Is there a microphone that uh, can go around for the other um, audience? I don't no. think so. Okay. Okay, so actually very little is known about um, feedback. There's only been a handful of motor learning studies where um, they've looked at, well, how do kids learn in regards to the uh, frequency of feedback and whether the focus is external versus uh, internal. And from those studies, this, this, I would say they're a mixed message, but um, what I would say is that it's not the same as typically developing uh, children and adults. Um, they may need more feedback, especially early on during learning, um, and the withdrawal, you know, because they're, they're learning at a much slower rate, 
the, the withdrawal of, of feedback and a focus to perhaps more external components of, of, of you know, how they're performing the task probably is different than, than that of a typically developing trial. But, you know, the important, you know, caveat here is, as I mentioned early on, these are motor learning based approaches. The idea that you're placing active training, uh, you know, in creating uh, environments where individuals are trying to attain skill, but we don't really know enough about, you know, how these kids learn. And, you know, some of these even basic studies of, you know, how much practice, what type of feedback, you know, whether it's random or, or blocked in terms of, you know, providing practice of one activity or multiple act activities and you know, feedback schedules and uh, whether the focus is internal versus external. These are wide open. Um, it's a whole field that needs to be opened up. And that could easily be done in a therapy environment. Any other questions? Can I ask if, because um, most of the um, studies that have been uh, published have been on children with cerebral palsy, predominantly children with hemiplegia. Um, however, I think in practice it's being applied to other populations like traumatic brain injury, brachial plexus. Um, can you comment on its applicability to other populations? Um, yeah, so there have not been uh, many studies or hardly any at all that have looked at other, other populations. Um, Nevertheless, if the principle really is, the important component is learning and skill practice. Um, and basically, um, you know, these models are, are definitely ways of achieving massed amounts of practice in short environments. So um, I have yet to see an individual who doesn't improve in some way or another from these intensive types of, of approaches. Whether that's captured well or not by these measures may be a different issue. Um, but yes, I, I think. Um, these, it, it's absolutely applicable to um, TBIs and uh, you know, either in, uh, individuals who have strokes or later on in, in life as well. Right. Other questions? In a group versus one-to-one. -one. Could, could you repeat the question? Yes. The, uh... So the question is um, the relative merits of a group approach, uh, in which case here it was with the important addition of uh, interventionists by the side of each child, but still the group approach versus an individual individual approach to this type of treatment. Yeah. So again, models haven't really been compared uh, to, to each other um, in, in, in individual studies. There's only cross studies that you can uh, make some, some summaries in. Um, there doesn't seem to be an effect, and most of the studies are in constraint therapy. So, as I said, there's about 80 studies of constraint therapy. There's only maybe less than 10 studies of bimanual training, and none of them have modified these uh, approaches, group versus individual. Um, what I can say for the constraint is that it seems like the ratio is less important because the restraint is taking out the uh, the possibility of, of um, adapting or, or um, compensating. For bimanual training, again, as, as I said, my, my own um, uh, bias, I guess, is that you probably do need to have closer to one-to-one. -to -one. Um, it might depend upon the child's age and their attention and, and so forth, but um, to make sure that you elicit the movements that you want with the affected upper extremity, um, you might need to be one step ahead of them. Bimanual training, I should point out, it's much harder to do. You know, they, these kids are clever, and they compensate, and they um, basically uh, mentally, it's much, much more tiring for a therapist to be, you know, thinking about what's the next thing that the child's going to do if I place an object here versus there, um, and where and, and to negotiate with the child in many cases. Um, whereas the constraint that removes that choice, um, you know, from, from the equation, um, that doesn't mean the constraint is a is a better approach. It's a different approach, and it might be depending upon the child and the environment and the goals and so forth that matters. Okay, thank you so much. Um, oh, one webinar question and then we'll have our next speaker. So, uh, Martin is, uh, is saying thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, he says, do you think that clinical scales, AHA, Jebson, Taylor, are adequate to adequately measure the improvement in hand motor function in activities of daily living? 
And should we think of other measures, for example, accelerometer, to better understand how the hand is used at home or at school? Yes. So when I first started doing this work back in, well, my first case study started in 1997. And there were almost no measures of um, hand function that were appropriate for kids with hemiplegia. Jepson Taylor, um, you know, I focused a lot on amount of time or speed that it takes, but that's not necessarily function. Um, it's a test that, you know, uh, basically is, uh, has been validated in children with unilateral uh, disabilities, um, but it captures just one aspect of, of, of hand function. Um, so that's been a challenge for us very early on, and it was only when the assisting hand assessment came out where, uh, you know, focusing more on nat naturalistic environments and how the child chooses to use the hand, um, I think where we could start to, to think more about what the bigger effects. Even the assisting hand assessment is done by an evaluator um, in a clinical setting. And that doesn't necessarily tell you how the child um, chooses to use it under, you know, when they know they're not being watched. Accelerometry is a, a tricky um, uh, measurement. It's something that we have done both in the, um, the clinical and the home environment. Um, we absolutely see increases in the amount that the child chooses to use the affected hand. Um, but when you send a child home with an accelerometer, uh, you need to make measurements for relatively long periods of time because uh, the amount that they use the hand depends upon the activities that, you're, that the child is engaged in. Um, it's been successfully done in adults with uh, hemiparesis, but adults have regular schedules. They get up, they have coffee, they go to work, or you know, go to a routine. Children, um, you know, might depend upon whether they're in school or not, but you know, it also depends upon the weather and scheduled activities. And in our attempts to use accelerometer in the home environment, we found it over even a three or four day period too variable to captured or to be sensitive enough, or maybe it's oversensitive in a way, to, um, to basically document uh, changes. And probably it would be need, need to be done for a longer period of, of time. But I think it's, it's not just how often the child uses the hand, it's function. And I think, you know, um, measuring goals, parents' perception of how children are using the hand in their environment and, uh, you know, on standard motor, age-appropriate motor activities is important but especially on the goals that the caregivers um, and the children uh, have for themselves. And I think that's one uh, way that we've uh, gotten at, you know, how is the child using this in the home. And it depends on the, the parent's perception rather than a quantitative measurement. But, um, but that perception, I think, is important, especially if these approaches are going to be family-centered. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gordon, for this really... There's uh, oh, there's a <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we're... Um, Running kind can, of like we can perhaps save it for the end. Sure. Okay, so we'll we'll save some questions for the end of this session. So we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Bailey.